Hello everybody, Mike here at Game from Scratch, and welcome to the next chapter in our ongoing Godot 3 tutorial series. Today we are going to be covering desktop input, specifically keyboard, mouse, and joystick handling. And we're going to look at how to approach each one of these from a couple of different directions. We're going to look at pulled input, event-driven input, and finally using action maps, which is probably the way you will ultimately implement your input handling using the Godot game engine. Now, if you're new to this series, this full series built on top of the previous parts, and if you're interested, I am also doing an ebook, which if it is for sale by now there is a link down below otherwise i'm doing preview uh, chapters as i create them for patron backers all right without further ado let's jump right in oh also there will be a link to gamefromscratch.com with all of the source code from this particular example we we're about to go through so if you just need some source follow that link head on over um all right so here i am creating a brand new empty project nothing too special happening here all right here we go i'm gonna just go ahead create a root node and then we're gonna create a sprite node underneath it. There's not gonna be a lot of flashy graphics in this because this is all about input. All right, so the first guy here is our sprite that we are going to control via a script. Uh, let's save our scene, that's fine. Uh, we then will attach a new script to this guy. So, and we'll do our first run. All right, so we're happy and good. Nothing magical happening yet, but we have the framework for a game to work with. So the first thing we're gonna look at is handling via polling. Now polling is a pretty straightforward process and the choice of what you go with action map, polling or event driven all comes down to you. Um, if you prefer to um, have your game respond as events come in, um, you'd use event driven. If you want to check for events yourself, you would use polling. And polling is a very simple concept. Basically, every pass through the game loop, so every time update is called, we're just basically going to ask Godot, hey, was there any input? Was there any input? Was there any input? And really, that's about it. So the first thing we're obviously going to need to do is implement our process function. This guy right here. And let's first check with um, keyboard handling. So if input dot is key press and really that is it and you're going to see a lot of this going on as we go forward basically input is a singleton provided by the Godot game engine uh, that allows you access to various different input objects um, one of which obviously is the ability to pull the keyboard as we were seeing here and every time that Godot runs its own game loop it update, updates the status of all of the input devices that are attached so this is the quickest and easiest way to check them and we are going to check this constant so basically, if the key left is pressed, um, this will be true. Now, one thing to notice is sometimes I use parentheses, sometimes I don't. Completely optional in if statements in Godot. So if you notice, I keep switching back and forth between the two. Uh, it's just habit for the most part, to be honest. And in the event that the left key is pressed, we'll move our sprite, which I guess I need to define in a second, to the left. And we can do similar logic for right. Now this constant definition is actually not in input. It's in the, um, the global scope. I'll show you exactly what I mean in a second. So if we go here to classes, search for the at and then global scope. And this is basically where all of the Godot global definitions are defined, including as you can see, uh, constants for mouse buttons, constants for joystick buttons, a bunch of error conditions. Um, Etc. Etc. But also, all of your keys are currently defined there. All that they're really doing is turning it from a system code into something that makes sense in your own source code. So those are all defined in the at global scope. So if you want to find the reference, that is where it's located. All right. So we check for the left. We check for right. Um, and I'll also show you. Oops. I'll show you up and a shift modifier. So basically, you can have multiple keys pressed at the same time, as we will show here. So is key pressed, key up. So if the up key is pressed, we also want to check to see if the shift key is pressed. And it's it's literally this easy. Like so, and in the event that it is, we'll move by 10. Otherwise, we will just move by one. All right, pretty straightforward. Let me head on back over to, oops, made an error. Uh, see there, I'm actually mixing and matching myself. Bad me. All right. 
I assume we're right now. I'll go back over to my editor, and now we actually need to do something so we can see on screen. So we'll do like we always do. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. My node selected. Let's just use our icon for the texture, and then we'll roughly position this guy near the middle of the screen. That way our keyboard handling actually has something to handle. Save that out, run our code. And now you see I press left, we move to the left. I press right, we move to the right. I press up, we move up. I press shift and up, we move up very fast. So there is pulling for keyboard input. Very simple, very straightforward to do. Um, let me just zoom that in so it's a little bit easier for you guys to read. Uh, yeah, that's about it. I was also handling shift down, but really that's just a bunch of copy and paste code. So now let's go ahead and implement two other things. One, we're just gonna handle uh, quitting. So this is just for, well, for one, it's a way for me to show you how you can actually quit your Godot application. And two, I'll show you how to handle a specific uh, key. In this case, we'll just handle the Q key. And to quit an application, you simply call git tree quit, like so. So now we run our application. You hit the Q key and your application will exit. Now I'm not sure the behavior of that for an HTML5 target, for, for all the other targets, it should shut down the application. Um, now finally, let's go ahead and take a look at handling the mouse via polling and it's almost the exact same logic. So if input dot is mouse button pressed, and then again, this define is in the um, uh, global scope as we saw earlier on. And if the mouse button is pressed, we will go ahead and you might also notice that I do self.position as opposed to just position. The self is totally not required, but it does give you, I don't know, that's actually very little reason to do it. I just happen to personally prefer that look of code. Okay, so in this case, when we hit the mouse button on the left-hand side, we are going to jump the sprite to whatever the current position of the mouse is. Now, you notice you pulled the mouse's position from the viewport and not from the input itself. So basically, this will tell you where the current mouse cursor is relative to the viewport. And you gotta remember that the root of every single scene is a special node of type viewport. So that's why we're doing get viewport and get mouse position. So if you have multiple viewports, obviously you're going to have to update this logic a little bit. And um, let's go ahead and run that. So now if I left click, boom, we teleport to wherever we are currently handling. So uh, pretty straightforward, pretty cool stuff. Um, let's modify our code just a little bit. Now we're gonna move on to uh, event driven. Now this works a little bit different. So instead of actually polling or saying, hey, what are you guys doing? What's happened? Has anything changed? Has anything changed? We instead say, tell us when something changes. And for that, there is a special function available. Um, it is a callback function. So we're just gonna go ahead and get rid of all of this. You can basically get rid of everything if I'm honest. So let's be honest. Uh, instead, you override a function called input. And input is passed a value called event. Now, event is of type event. Oh, why do I always forget this? Uh, event. Input event is the base class, and there's a number of different input events. So I'll actually bring this up and show you uh, input event. So this is the type of class that is passed into our um, input function. So every time an input event occurs, that function will be called. It will pass the appropriate event type. Now this is the base class, and you'll see there's various different functions to find, but it will always be of a specific kind. Um, and normally, okay, where do they go? Let me go back, uh, input event with modifiers. Yeah, so here you see it could be a key event or a mouse event, for example. And in the event that it's a key event, you'll see there's uh, pressed, scan code, etc. So there are specific values that go along with specific events. And that's gonna come handy in a second. So now in our event code, so this is gonna call it every time that event occurs. So it's gonna be event driven, pushed to us as it happens. So. Uh, I'm going to need a variable for a little bit later. I will explain why in a second. But let's go ahead and create it first. So uh, all we're going to do here is handle the mouse. Um, it will, we'll show the simplest one, handling key event first. So if event is input 
event key. So basically what I'm saying here is if the event type that was passed in is an event key event, so this means that the keyboard was pressed, then we know that it's got specific methods available for it. Specifically, um, we can now see the scan code of it. The scan code is the numeric code that, goes along, that corresponds to every single keyboard. Now what it often makes sense to do is to convert that back to um, something that's human readable, which is what we're about to see here. So straightforward enough, all we are going to do here is um, print out what key was pressed. So print uh, key pressed plus, and then I want to turn that event code into a character um, so we can actually see what key it was if it, if it was a valid character. So that's basically turning a number back into a principal char. But the value being passed to us is the scan code, like so. Um, that will tell us what key was pressed. Now there's another key value here, pun not intended, called echo. And that value will be set to true if the key was already pressed. So this is a good way of knowing if a key was held down or not. And we'll also check that. So event.echo, and again, these values, scan code and echo, are only attached to this particular type of event. That's why we check to see what the type was before working on it. Um, equals true. We're gonna go ahead and say print key was held down. Otherwise, we're going to say first press, like so. And let's go ahead and run this code. And now you'll, oop, now you'll wait for it to actually run. Oh, I think I did an error. I did an error. If event.echo equals true, uh, let's throw our colon in, let's try that again. And you notice here I am skipping back and forth. I, I apologize for that. It's years and years and years of habit. One was equivalent to the other. I'm just trying to be a little bit more, oh, and I did it with the else too. And let's put the colon in. That's another thing. It's, um, Python and Godot are both the only languages that have a Godot after a conditional. So it's another thing that kind of my brain screws up all the time. All right, so here we are in our project now. And watch down here. You'll see as I press keys, It'll say either first pressed or so now I'm going to hold down the A key and you can see was held down. So handling input key events is that simple. Now let's move on to the mouse. The mouse is also quite simple, but uh, so what we're going to do on the mouse is have it as we move our cursor around, uh, we're going to update the position of our sprite. Whereas when we click, we're going to, what did I do? I jump back to the middle of the screen. The only catch is um, we're going to want to make sure that when we warp, the position, the start position, I'll, I'll show you the result without the just warped and then we'll move back there and add it in. Um, all right, so now we go, if event is input event mouse, mouse you, mouse motion. So that's the event that is fired when we move the mouse around and we'll check to see if we warp, just warped. That means we didn't just teleport the uh, frame the last, because basically just quickly moving the mouse screws it up, and I'll show you why in a second. So if not just warped, we're going to just go ahead and translate. So we're gonna move our stealth relative to, and then if we go, event.relative. And now event.relative is basically the amount that the mouse moved since the last move event. And that's why we want to do this warp thing because if we all of a sudden jump back, um, it's going to, the, this next relative value is going to be really screwed up because it doesn't know that you overrode the position like we we're going to in a second. So that's why we've got this if just warp test in there. So we're going to translate. So this is being passed the position. So if we move two to the left and two down, this will be a vector of negative two and two uh, as an example. So this is just the amount that we've moved since the last movement or the last frame update. Um, all right, so that is that. Uh, so that will move us as we move. Um, otherwise, just warped equals false. All right, we'll give that a run. Arr. Noticing a trend? All right, let's try that again. This so is now when we run our code, as we move our mouse, we are moving relative to it. Now the downside is since we came in off screen, we're not um, synced up. This is part of that relative again. 
So our, we started in the central position, but we came in from off screen. So we're moving relative to where our cursor is on screen, but that's probably not exactly what you wanna do. So what we're going to do is have it so that if we click the left mouse button, uh, we move the uh, sprite to the current cursor position, or if we right click, we're gonna move the sprite to the center line. So now we need to handle mouse clicks. So if event dot is input event mouse, uh, monsieur mouse button, like so. All right, so in the event, so here we'll, we'll use a switch or a match statement, event dot button index. So this is the number of the button that was defined. These again are defined in the global scope. So in the event of button left, we are now going to warp the mouse to the position uh, of our cursor. No, we're gonna warp our cursor to the position of, so basically we're gonna move our mouse pointer to our sprite. So input dot warp mouse button, which is a nice way of saying, basically teleport it to, and then the position of our sprite, like so. And we just warped, so we let it know. Yep, just warped. All right. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I don't know what just happened. All right, stop pissing me off. All right, here we go. And on the event of button right, we instead are going to move our position to the center of the screen. We've already seen this logic before. Self.position equals vector two, uh, get viewport dot size dot x div two, get viewport size dot y div two. All right, and I think that should be it for our example. So we'll go ahead and run this. And now you see, again, we are moving relative to our mouse cursor. We hit left, and then we've now warped our mouse cursor to match our um, sprite location. And again, we can go off screen and then come back on and, and be all weird again. And then left click just to sync back up to our position. And then if we're over here and we wanna go back to the center, boom, we're back to the center. Now do notice though, that once again, we are relative again. So that's why that warp is in there. Because when you jump the cursor around, it's not gonna know, uh, you know, it's a very big movement for that next frame. So we want that next relative to not show that we moved by 300 pixels. Otherwise it's gonna be really offset as you saw earlier. And essentially that is event driven mouse processing. Um, Again, pretty straightforward stuff we're doing so far. Uh, we just handle uh, in the input event as opposed to in the uh, process event. Um, but yeah, that was kind of about it. So now that we've got that working, time to delete everything we just did and move on to the gamepad. Now, the first thing we're gonna do with the gamepad is actually handle the uh, is it connected or not connected? Uh, one of the things about game pads is batteries die, you trip over the cord, uh, you know, it, it's quite common for a game pad to be disconnected. So this is one of those ones where it makes sense to check for. So in our ready function, oops, I put the underscore in the wrong spot, funk ready, like so. We are going to check to see if the, um, if our connection is there or not. We can do this, uh, I think we could do this with a node, but we will wire this by hand. Uh, so basically input.connect like so. Connect has, there you see there's two, script change and joy connection change. We're gonna check for joy connection change. We're gonna wire it to ourselves, And then when we find it, we are going to call the function joy con changed like so. So obviously we should probably implement that function. Joy con changed. I don't think that gets, did that get past a value? Yes, it did. It gets past a couple values. Device ID and is connected. So the first one basically is a uh, identifier for the device that was uh, connected or disconnected. Keep in mind, you can have multiple joysticks connected at the same time. And the second is a Boolean over if this was a connection or a disconnection. And well, we're not gonna really do much with this. Uh, we're basically gonna say, if this, is this actually connected? In the event that it is connected, we'll do some diagnostics here. So uh, print joystick uh, space plus, and then we'll turn that device ID back into a string space connected. So in the event that we plug in a joystick, 
Uh, we're going to print out that it was connected. And we'll now identify, because there are so many different peripherals out there, we want to know if um, Godot could figure out what kind of joystick it was. There's pre-built definitions in there for X input devices, which is your Xbox 360 controller, your Xbox One controller, probably the most common controller you'll find uh, in the PC world, and also the kind that other controllers try to be compatible with. Or there's also PS4 controllers, and you've also got weirdo third-party ones, the Steam controller, etc. So what we're going to do is check to see if Godot actually recognized it. And this is done using the function isJoyGnome. And then what we're doing, and you'll notice this a lot, you pass in an index um, to all of these functions. Basically, you're saying joystick one, joystick two, joystick three, joystick four. That's again how you can support multiple joysticks. Now we're gonna, we know that there's at least one joystick connected, so we can get away with doing this. Um, so we'll just go. So if it's here, it's a rec recognized controller. Uh, like so. And then we will go print and then input dot get joy name. And you can use this basically to figure out uh, what kind of controller you're dealing with. It'll say PS4 or X input, etc., as we will see in a second. Um, like so. Now I have a. What is your issue here? Oh, look, I forgot my, forgot my colon. All right. So in theory, this code should work. Uh, let's go ahead and run that. Da, 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 da. Now what I gotta do uh, is reach into my backpack and grab a controller. So what I'm doing is that plugging in an Xbox One controller via USB right now. Uh, you'll probably hear the familiar da, 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 da. Oop. That port's in use. Come on, stupid. Okay, what I'm doing is trying to plug one in. All right. Why aren't you going in? Okay, there we go. So controller was just plugged in and boom. Oh, my bad. <sighs> Forgot to put the input signal to, yeah, singleton in here. But as you could tell, it did eventually fire this code. So just remove my controller, run our code. Our code is running, watch down here. I shall go ahead and plug it in, hopefully with more success this time. There you go. So let it find my controller and then boom, you can see it was connected. It's joystick zero. It was a recognized controller and it is of type X input game put gamepad device found. So that is how you check for a controller. At the same time, if I unplug it, we would get a, the same function would have called, but instead this value would have been as false. And we didn't really actually handle anything on that. So we could probably just go ahead and say, and that code will run when you unplug the controller. And just take my word for that that works so we won't bother testing that out. So now we're gonna go ahead and actually um, handle the controller. And we'll do this in the uh, process function. So we're polling in this particular example. So first things first, let us check to see um, that we have a controller attached. We can do that using Input dot get connected joy pads that will return an array of device IDs. Uh, I don't really care about that. What I instead care is that the size of said array is at least one. So if we get to this point in time, we know that there is at least one controller connected to our machine. So now that we know that, what can we do with it? Well, we can, uh, let's see, what am I gonna do here? And handle the x-axis, x-axis. Now. It can get a little confusing when you're dealing with a um, gamepad. The, the buttons don't always match up perfectly, so there's a bunch of aliases created for us here. So input dot, all right, get joy axis. And what we do is ask for device zero, and the axis we want is axis zero. Uh, this axis zero is the right um, analog stick on the controller. So joy axis zero. Now you'll notice there was a bunch of accesses. Uh, five and six are triggers. 
Uh, zero is the right analog stick, one is the left analog stick, and so on. So you can get some that have like flight simulators where it twists, or you could have a throttle, etc. So you can have a bunch of different axes to find. So we are going to check the axis on one. Now, one of the things that you're gonna find with a controller is that you often want it, it will register small movements left, right, up, and down, even if you're not actually pushing it. So there's something called a dead zone that you normally work in, and it's the first little bit of the controller where you say, all right, just ignore input within this range. We're gonna make it, uh, what did I go with, 20%. So var dead zone equals 0 0.2. So what I'm saying is, unless your value is higher than 0.2 in any particular direction, ignore it. So back to our logic down here, that is where we were going to use our dead zone. So if ABS basically just turns into an absolute, so it strips the sign off, X axis is greater than dead zone. So this will be, if you gotta push it at least 20% of the way, uh, axes go from zero to one or zero to minus one, depending on which direction they are going. All right, so if we are pushing it at least that much, uh, we now want to go ahead and uh, if x axis is less than zero, self dot. All right, this is very annoying scrolling spot. Right, let me just boom you up a bit. Self dot position dot x minus equals. All right, and I'm about to throw a bunch at you here. 100 times delta. So we're gonna move it by a base amount of 100 pixels per second. We've used this logic already, and it's already been explained. Times, oh, and I'm gonna throw a variable at you. This is also our own variable here. Var speed multiplier equals three. This is where your sensitivity setting would ultimately come in. You could basically create it organically to something that feels good. But this is the amount that you're gonna multiply the input by. So this is the amount of response you're gonna end up getting. You know, you don't need to have this at all, but you'll find in your logic, your movement will be probably kind of sluggish if the speed modifier isn't set. And a lot of users will like to have a sensitivity setting of some form. So in my case, I'm implementing it as a speed multiplier. Times, and then once again, the absolute value of x axis. So keep in mind, x axis again is a value between zero and one or zero to negative one if you're pushing to the left. So what we've got here is for example, this could be halfway pushed to the right would be 0.5 times three is 1.5. And then say we're moving at um, 60 frames per second. So this would be around 13. Uh, so that'll move you relative to that total amount. So that is what the logic here is calculating. I'm probably missing a parenthesis here, I am. All right, now through the power of cut and paste coding, if the value is greater, we instead want exact same logic, we just wanna use a plus. So let's go ahead and run that code out. And you will now see Oops, so my bad, axis zero is the left stick, not the right stick. So there you see the left stick, right stick, and if I do it just a little bit, we go slow, full on, we go fast. And that is why I am multiplying the axis by the translation amount. So if you just wanted to use this like full on or full off, just get rid of this logic part right here. So everything to the right of the asterisk, including the asterisk, just get rid of that and you'll turn this basically back into a digital stick. But that's the thing with the axis. They are full analog and they've got degrees from zero to one. So you can have, you know, amount of intensity behind your push. Whereas in the D-pad, it is literally just on or off. Speaking of D-pad, the D-pad is literally just a button. So let's look at that now. Handling the D-pad is ultra simple. So back here, so we are in our, if a joystick is connected, now we're gonna go ahead and check for D-pad movement. I'm only gonna do one axis. So if input dot uh, is joy button pressed, and they literally handle just like buttons. So the first thing you do again is pass in the controller you want, and second, you pass in the button you want to test. Now you will notice in these definitions, there are a number of predefines for different controllers, such as the Xbox and the Sony controllers, or you can use the generic buttons, like button zero, button one, etc. And generally they will match up, but this is one of those areas where 
Um, device to device, it can get a little freaky. Uh, but what we are going to do instead, once again, button D, oh, joy, yeah. Oh, D pad. Oh, again, it's just a button. And in the event of up, oh, self.position.y, and I'm gonna be really boring about this, uh, minus equals one. We go ahead and run our code. So now if I hit the D-pad, we move up by one each time, like so. So again, buttons are literally, face pads, D-pads, and buttons are all handled in the exact same way using pretty much the exact same logic. And there are up to 16 buttons attached, so let's just show that quickly and then we will move on. So you can also go through all of your buttons that are pressed. So let's show, so for I in range, Say there's, I think it's commonly up to 16 buttons on an Xbox device, for example. Uh, so, and if uh, input that is uh, joy button press zero comma I. So if we're currently pressing a button, we're just gonna echo out what it is. Um, so it can be any of the 16 possible button combinations. We'll just go um, button plus uh, stir i uh, da, 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 pressed should be, and we can turn, we've got for each possible button by index, we can actually turn it back into a string using input dot get joy button string and pass in the index of the button. Uh, am I ending my print statement? Yes, but I think I screwed something up. Oh, that's why I screwed up. All right, what am I doing wrong? 34. Uh, nope, didn't have a close. All right, so now let's go ahead and run. screwed something up is joy button press press where did I do that what line joy button press yeah that was dumb all right Let's start this all over again here we go so now you see again left stick we could just as easily convert that to a different axis if we wished or the triggers or however we wished uh, by switching the axis out d-pad up and as you can see, I'm gonna start doing buttons. So here's the A button, look down here for the result, and I will just go A and on. So A button, this is button zero, B button, button one, uh, X button, button two, Y button, button three, D pad, 12, so up is 12, right is 15, down is 13, left is 14. A trigger will actually fire as a button, but also as an axis, so you can treat them either way. Left bumper is button four, right bumper is button five. Uh, button nine is the right stick down. Button eight is the left stick down. Uh, the home button, I think it's called, the menu button. Uh, and that was every button, I think, yeah. So that is all of the various different buttons and all of their defines. Now, one of the cool things, once again, if we go back here to the uh, global scope, you will actually see behind each button, theoretically, which gamepad button it is. So I think if you see like the X button should be two, three, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm not really sure why you would code directly to the Xbox set or the PlayStation 4 set, unless for some reason you were working with those very specifically, uh, but these are basically the same definitions as the generic button versions. 
Finally, we're going to take a look at action maps. Now, action maps or input maps are a way of just tying it all together. Basically, with an input map, you create um, a mapping between the various kinds of inputs, such as your mouse, your joystick, your keyboard, etc., and you give it an alias or an action that occurs when that happens. This way, you can have multiple um, forms of input all handled with one set of code. Now, this is a two-step process. First off, we need to handle it by creating the input map. To do so, go to your project settings right here and switch over to the input map tag over here. Now, notice there's a bunch already defined for UI management, but what we're going to do instead is create our own. And we're just going to do a simple one for handling left. So on left, type in the name of the action and then click add. Now you scroll to the bottom, you'll see that left was now added as an additional option here. Click the plus sign to the side of it to define a new action to map to that label. And we're going to do, go ahead and add a keyboard action for it. And it's going to prompt us to, uh, to press a key to add. So we'll go ahead and press the uh, left key. Now, if you want to implement WASD key, W-A-S-D key input, you could also do that as well. So we'll just do a plus another one, add another key, and in this case, we'll do A. So now left will fire if you press the left or the A. And on top of that, let's go ahead and define one more, and we'll do uh, joystick axis, uh, device zero, uh, analog axis left. Okay, so that'll work, and we'll add that in. So there you can see you can define multiple uh, different input events all map back to the same single individual action. So now that our map is defined, it's just a matter of using it in code, and it's very, very straightforward. Just head on over here to our code. Uh, once again, we can purge everything. And in our process or input, actually we'll handle this one in input, So and we can check if, and then event dot, you'll notice here, why are you not firing right? Is action left, like so. And then in that case, we just go self.position.x minus e equals one. So you see how all of those different actions have now been just defined as a single type of action that we can test for. Uh, and we can go ahead and run that. And now if we press any of those input devices, left, we move. So there's the left arrow key. There is the uh, A key. And there is the left thumbstick being pressed. So that is how you can go ahead and create an input map, which kind of just brings it all together. Chances are you're probably going to use input maps for your controls because it allows you to make your controls a bit more generic. There's also programmatic ways of adding to or creating the action map. So you can actually add to it using code. Uh, so you can give the user the ability to confine, con, um, do their own custom actions, etc., and define the map that way. But then your end input handling code all stays exactly the same. But we're not going to actually specifically cover that today. I don't want to get this video being too, too long. In fact, actually, I'm going to wind the video down now. Hopefully, we covered everything you're interested in seeing for input. Don't worry if you're into um, mobile devices, you want to get details there. I will cover that in a different chapter when we cover things like touch, gestures, uh, motion sensors, etc. That will be in a different chapter. So hopefully, this is proving to be a useful series for you. Again, there is a book-based version covering the exact same content. If you're interested in checking that out, do check either the purchase link down below if it exists yet or the um, Patreon link uh, and really uh, helps the channel out. And hopefully you get a book that's useful to you. Uh, that is it for now. I believe I'm going to be moving on to... Um, I was planning to do sound effects next, but I think I actually might do widgets and or GUI programming and then sound effects because the one sort of depended on the other in the way I implemented my example. Um, so do stay tuned. There is more Godot coverage coming, and hopefully this was useful to you. If you do have any comments or suggestions, do let me know in the comments down below. All right, that's it for now. I will see you all later. Goodbye.